Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast with your hosts, Shelley and Bella. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 67 of the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast. So hope you all had a nice Christmas, guys. I didn't. I know. Yeah, I had to work Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and the day after Boxing Day. Yeah, and all for an employer who said you have to work 12-hour shifts, even though last year you did exactly the same over Christmas and worked just 12-hour shifts, and also weren't prepared to give you even a Christmas dinner. I know, that's the worst bit. But you've got to give the people that you care for, you've got to feed them their Christmas dinner. So all the time you're getting hungry, wishing for a Christmas dinner, and your employer couldn't even... Well, talk about humbug. I know, right? Well, we did have a Christmas party, and everybody got invited, but you had to pay to go, so I didn't go. I got a pretty good boss, because my bosses, they paid for us to have a Christmas party... They paid for our meal. They paid for some drinks. They give us time off over Christmas. I'll tell you who your bosses remind me of. You remember Christmas Vacation, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase? Yeah. I want to be like his brother-in-law. And oh, I, yeah. <laughs> and I want to go and get your boss and, and bring him to the house hogtied. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ready for you to tell him exactly what you think of him. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think. We'd probably go to jail for that. Yeah, probably. Pretty sure, yeah. Probably. Anyway, stop being so down on Christmas. Hopefully everybody had a good Christmas, and hopefully the people that I was around on Christmas had a better Christmas because I was there. Yeah, I'm sure they did. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, please welcome to the show one of the world's leading crop circle photographers and researchers. She's a founder member of the Centre for Crop Circle Studies. She's widely known and is an international authority on the subject and the pioneer researcher into the effects of electromagnetic fields on living systems. This includes the physiological and psychological effects reported by people after visiting or being in the vicinity of a crop formation. She's the author of several books on crop circles, including Crop Circles, The Greatest Mystery of Modern Times, and her newest book, The Energies of Crop Circles, The Science and Power of a mysterious intelligence. She lectures all over the world and we're really pleased and proud to have her with us today. Please welcome to the show, Lucy Pringle. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Hello. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. How did you get started in crop formations? Well, it all really started, oh, about 30 years ago, in about 1990. And both my my sons had left home and there's a very nasty sort of empty feeling when you suddenly find that you're not looking after people and that you've got a great big empty hole in your life. Yes. And so you you say to yourself, well, I wonder how on earth I'm going to fill this. And you can either sink down into into the depths of gloom or you can sort of gird up your loins and say, well, listen, I'm going to I'm going to find something new. And at long last, I actually have time to do something for myself. So in a way, you can change it around and make it quite exciting. And it just so happened that at that particular time, crop circles were happening very, very close to where I was living in Hampshire. And there was suddenly a a flurry of excitement about the subject. And I came in on the very sort of early, early days. And I became a member, a foundation member of the Crop Circle Centre for Crop Circle Studies, which was the first academic society. Incidentally, it is now. Uh, defunct. It closed some time ago. But it was a society which investigated scientifically and academically what was happening in the fields. And it expanded all over the world. We had branches in America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, all over Europe. We were suddenly, it, it became a worldwide uh, phenomenon. And it, 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 it sort of struck home uh, with many, many people who love unexplained phenomena. As we do, and as our listeners do. So this is yes. right up our alley. Exactly. So crop circles don't seem to get reported as much 
any more. And one would assume by that that it's because the number of cases are decreasing. Is this true? No, no, no. Unfortunately, it's not at all. It's as though there's some hidden agenda. The press do their very, very, very best to rubbish the uh, subject. I once sent up a scientific paper to them. None of the papers wanted to know. And they'll go, in fact, to great lengths to only interview people. And there are people who make crop circles, and they give them great exposure and great publicity. And they refuse to acknowledge anything about the veracity or the scientific investigations that are going on regarding the subject. And, I mean, I can give you an example. The National Geographic is, is actually one of the very, very worst offenders. I did a program once with them oh, many years ago, and they wanted me to do this program about my research because I'd been doing it for oh, 30 years. And I said, well, how many people are going to be on the program? And they said, oh, just you. So I said, well, that's all right. So we went into a field and we did an interview, and I was very surprised by the rather trite and superficial questions I was being asked. And then a couple of days later, uh, another circle appeared, uh, very close to the one in which we'd been doing the interview. So I got in touch with the producer, and I said, I wonder if you know anything about that circle. And they said, oh, yes, 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 we made it. We had it made with the farmer's permission. And I said, but hold on, that wasn't part of the agreement. Oh, Lucy, you, you'll be quite happy. Once you see the program, you'll be quite happy. Well, they sent me the program. And I had precisely half a minute. And the people who'd made the circle had two and a half minutes. So that just gives you an example. But to follow that, to make it even worse with the National Geographic, they wanted to do another program with me and several other researchers. We all said no. We'd all had bad experiences. We knew what they were like. And a friend of mine from the Netherlands, he was walking past Silbury Hill one night at about midnight because everything seems to happen during the night. Well, mostly, anyhow. He was walking past Silbury Hill and he saw at an angle across the road lights up by West Kennet Long Barrow. So he walked up. And he found a film crew there. And he said to the producer, what are you doing? And she said, oh, we're from the National Geographic. And we are photographing men making a circle. Oh, he said, how interesting. So he went over and he watched these men walking around with their poles and, and, and everything. And what, he was abs what completely astounded him was that they weren't walk making the circle, they were simply walking round an existing circle, a circle that had appeared two weeks before. Now, the way the National Geographic shot that uh, film, they, it looked to the world as though these people had actually made that formation. Now, that is fraud. Yeah. That is total deception. And this is what we're battling against constantly. If, if some, do you know, when I was at boarding school, we were allowed to have the National Geographic because it was supposedly a reputable magazine, scientifically well researched, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for them to sink to those depths was just beyond comprehension. It was so, you then have to say to yourself, well, why is this happening? What is happening? Was the pressure put on the National Geographic to do this, make this deception? And so you, 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 you come up with that. Uh, are they being pressurized by powers that be that they should rubbish this? And then you say, well, why? It's not a harmful subject. It's not doing people any harm at all. But then some people seem to be frightened of it for, for no reason whatsoever. Some people actually are very frightened of mysteries. Other people are fascinated, but other people are very frightened. When I was younger, I can't remember if I read something or we learned something in school or whatever it was, but I was really interested in it. And I remember when that program 
was on the television. Oh, really? It may not have been that specific one, but I, or maybe it was, and it was on a repeat, whatever. But I do know that I was watching it thinking, oh, that's upsetting because I thought they were unexplained. And then all of a sudden there they are on TV and they had these big things, some of them on their feet, didn't they? Just flattening the, the crops. And yes. so, yeah, I, I know what you mean that it does have an impact because I can remember watching shows or maybe that particular one where that was done. Well, I mean, they go to great lengths to, to do this in order to muddy the waters, if you like. And again, I, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know the reason, but I know the pressure or fear is behind it. Well, that's the beauty about independent programmes like this, is that we can actually speak to the serious researchers like yourself, and we can actually make sure that that message comes across because we don't answer to a big broadcasting company that has to some come to numbers and sponsors and everything else. So we're happy to give you this forum. Where do you think they come from? Yes, this is interesting because I've, I'm a firm believer that there is an intelligence, as my book says, a mysterious intelligence behind this phenomenon. And from whence that intelligence comes, we actually have no idea, we have no means of proving its origin. But on many occasions, people have meditated in order to try and link in by channeling with the crop circle intelligence. And they may have prepared a picture beforehand, a drawn a, a circle beforehand, one on which they concentrate and meditate. And in, in extraordinary circumstances, most of these actually appear within a very short time of the people meditating. Wow. There was one extraordinary formation that appeared oh fairly recently well it was it was it was it was astounding i wonder if i can actually find the dimensions it was a, a place called or and it had the most complex geometry of of really any formation that we've we've ever come across i'm just going to hunt through my papers. That's okay. Um, How are you spelling the name of that place? The place is O A R E okay. in Wiltshire, and that was actually uh, last year. It wasn't wasn't this summer, but it was it was last summer. And the farmer was quite upset by it. He didn't. He wasn't. He wasn't happy about it at all. But he did allow me. He actually mowed it out. He mowed it out uh, by oh twenty to eight in the morning. He did allow me to do tests in the circle, and we got extraordinary results. We'll talk about that right later. But somebody called Michael Glickman, who has been going up the circles after they formed, he's been doing it for the last 30 years, and he said he was astonished by the skill and precision embodied in the Martin Fell Hill. It is, in my view, one of the top 10 formations we have received. It contains 28 pentagrams and 140 precisely formed isosceles triangles, wow. each with a prime angle of 36 degrees, which automatically generates the golden section. Any suggestion that this meticulous and majestic crop formation might be man-made is bizarre to the point of lunacy. Yeah, because it was awfully precise, wasn't it? Well, that you can't be more precise than right, that. Right, exactly. <laughs> that is really quite quite amazing. We do get quite a lot of formations which, in fact, are extraordinarily complicated geometry, amazing geometry. But are, are others, this is very interesting because when I fly, I make the point of leaning out of the helicopter and trying to take photographs of it directly, uh, the vertical, so that people can then, the, the mathematicians and geometers, like Michael, can work out the geometry. And some of the man-made ones might look very, very good, but once you work them out, once you see a photograph and you can actually work out the geometry, 
they are always flawed. And the ones that are hoaxed as well, to my limited sort of knowledge about the subject, is that they tend to be done overnight. So you, you, you've got to factor in the fact that to be as precise as they are and appear overnight in one night, you know, you would expect some pretty intelligent equipment, even if it was human made, laser levels, guides, and those sorts of things don't seem to be happening. You don't seem to hear a lot of noise or a lot of sound or a load of ruckus around in the area. People aren't seeing lots of vehicles going in and out and lots of people with industrial sort of well, equipment. Well, occasionally they see lights in the field, but there was one very, very famous one that appeared during the daytime. This might be the one that I was going to ask you about because I was going to ask you about the video that was captured by John Whaley. Oh, no, no, that I, I don't go along with that at all. No? No. Okay. I think that could possibly be suspect because somebody who looked into it much more carefully than me and was, was had much better way of checking this, uh, he had quite a suspicious uh, background. Did but he? Anyhow, anyhow, it seemed that the light was in the wrong place for the time of day which he claimed it to be to be when he took it. Oh, right. Okay. So there were things that were irregular, if you like. Well, then tell us about the one that you were going to talk about, the one that appeared during the day. Well, this was actually an eyewitness account. Uh, well, so was the other one, supposedly. And this was one that happened to appear opposite Stonehenge. And I was giving a talk at uh, one of the Hampshire colleges Oh, many, many years ago, and somebody who'd been there took a taxi and just happened to say to the taxi driver, oh, I've been to a fascinating talk on crop circles. And the taxi driver said, oh, I saw one appear at Stonehenge. This got back to me very quickly, and I managed to get in touch with the taxi driver, and I said, oh, please do tell me more about this, because I've checked thoroughly with all the sources I've got, and there hasn't been one that has appeared opposite Stonehenge this year. And she said, oh, no, 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 it was several years ago. And I said, well, at this particular time, there only three have appeared opposite Stonehenge. One was in 1996, one was in 1997, and one was in 2002. I mean, this was now about 19 years ago. Anyhow, she said, oh, she said, I know it was in 1996. I know that for a fact she said, because I was travelling down to the West Country to see my son who was on leave from the army. And she said, moreover, I can tell you it was a Sunday because, she said, all the traffic was coming back and was really clogged up coming back from the West. And she said she had almost a clear run down to Stonehenge on the A303, which is notoriously <laughs> crowded and, and uh, the dreadful road. That features on the traffic news every day. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. You're quite correct. So anyhow, she said, as she was driving down from the roundabout, the Amesbury roundabout, you go downhill and you see Stonehenge in the distance. And I can tell you, it looks minute. And when we're flying, it's hard to pick it out. Unless you know where it actually is, it, it's actually very hard to pick out, which is seems incongruous because when you're right up with the stones, they are megaliths are gigantic. Anyhow, as she was driving down the hill, she saw a rather extraordinary cloud, an isolated cloud, hovering above the field opposite Stonehenge. So as she got closer, she saw a whole lot of cars parked into the fence on, on the opposite side of the road from Stonehenge. One came out and said she dashed in saying, I wonder what on earth people are looking at. They're leaning over the fence, looking into the field. So she took her place there, and to an absolute amazement, she saw the crop going down in front of her eyes. Wow. She simply couldn't believe it. And I don't think any of us, if we were standing, looking over a fence into a field, could be, believe seeing the crop going down. It was just amazing. You'd be looking for some way that you could explain that well actually absolutely some some visible force or some force making some noise there was no no noise and she said she couldn't see the shape because she was on the same level and she said so i said well what was happening to the cloud and she said well it was strange because there seemed to be some communication between the cloud and what was happening in the field because as the crop was expanding, the fallen crop was expanding, so the cloud was also expanding and rotating in a similar fashion. So 
I said, how long do you think this, this was all taking? And she said, I don't know. She said, I really don't know, because when you're watching something like that, you're not looking at your watch, are you? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I don't suppose I would be. No, good heavens, no. So I said, well, can you give me an idea, approximately? And she said, no, no, I can't. I really can't. So I pressed her once more, and she really got quite cross with me. And she said, look, Lucy, I know what I saw. I was there, so I know what I saw. You weren't there, so you don't know what I saw. Well, <laughs> she said about 20, 25 minutes, something like that, half an hour. Anyhow, so, I mean, there was, there was no answer to that. Were there any other witnesses that came forward to that case? You said that she stopped, there was a crowd of people looking at it. Well, this was a very strange thing, which I, I, I was going to mention, because you would say to yourself, well, I think there was a lapse of about seven or eight years before I heard about this. Why didn't anybody else come forward? And you can just put yourself in their place. There were a whole lot of people watching it. They were all seeing it together. They knew what they saw at that point. But then they go away, they drive in their separate directions, and they start to say to themselves, hmm, I wonder if I was imagining that. I wonder if I really was, what, it, what that really was happening. I just wonder it, and doubt creeps into their mind. And they're certainly not going to, go, going to go down to their local pub and say, I've just seen a crop circle appear. Yeah. And so it was only by chance that I heard about this because the taxi driver wasn't telling anybody about it. And it was, this is how things happen in the crop circle world. You have to be the right person in the right place to share about these things. Maybe there was something sort of going on so that people wouldn't necessarily remember it. You know, I mean, if something is powerful enough to make a crop circle appear, it could be that maybe there was a way that it could make people forget that they saw it. Well, I don't know about that because the taxi driver remembered it very, very, very clearly indeed. Anyhow, all the other, I wrote my first book in 1998. I interviewed a lot of people, uh, eyewitness accounts, who'd seen crop circles appear, but they'd all been just simple circles, in, and that took a matter of seconds. So here was somebody telling me it was taking between 20 and 30 minutes. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. So I was really, really quite despondent. And on driving on the way home, I thought to myself, now hold on a minute, maybe it just could be right, because all the other uh, reports were about a single simple circle. And here we have one which was 915.5 feet times 508. It was gigantic. And moreover, it had 151 circles. Could that have anything to do with it? So I got in touch with James Lance, with whom I wrote the book. He's, he's, a, he's a real um, scientific guru. He's a poly, polymath. And so I mentioned this to him. He was very excited about the cloud because he said this has always been part of his hypothesis about the forming, the, uh, the process of behind the formation of the, of the crop circles. And I said, but regarding this time element, could the size of the circle and the number of circles play any part? And he said, yes, of course, just send me the measurements. Well, in those days, the whole scene was very, very different. Farmers were happy to let you go into their fields if you asked their permission. Nowadays, due to the fact that people, it's become a worldwide phenomenon, it's become very commercial, and people come from all over the world, in Japan and all over the world, they end up in these great big charabons. The people who are leading the tour don't necessarily have any control. They see the circle and they go straight across the farmer's fields absolutely willy-nilly destroying his crop. They don't wait and go down, a, just count how many tram lines and then go down the correct tram line. They don't yeah. bother to do that. They have a complete disregard for the farmer's fields. And I feel very strongly about this because it's their, it's their land and it's their livelihood. Yep. So anyhow, in those days, in those early days, people or teams were going in and they were measuring up the crop circles, measuring them up precisely, 
I think until about 1998, and I've got all those measurements so we could tell really how long they all took to form. James came back and said, it's generally accepted that as a result of work conducted in the 1990s, it's possible to calculate the time a formation takes to appear based on the size and number of circles. The method relates to the Earth's gravitational and magnetic field. This predicts a velocity of the resultant vortex filament of about 10 foot per second. Now, that's very interesting. Mm. And he said, then went on to say, to create the 151 circles in the 915 times 580 foot pattern would take the order of 20 to 25 minutes to create. So the taxi driver was spot on. And he said, the descending force emits an electrical discharge which releases bubbles from the underground aquifers which rise up through the surface of the ground and patterns are formed. These patterns develop like in Boydley, half above the ground and half under the ground in a sort of looping manner. There is less pressure outside than inside. Therefore, there's a sort of sucking down motion from inside which bends or sucks down the crop at the base. Now, I've had many reports about the changes in pressure changes in temperature when people go in. There was one story from Russia where a physicist was um, on holiday. She was in Siberia and uh, Dasha there. And she found she was walking in the woods and, and the glade was a, all the grass was flattened. And she went in and she thought, oh, this is quite a different temperature inside to outside. So she she repeated it, and every single time the temperature was quite different, so clearly the pressure was different. To go on with this, James then talks about the mist. The mist would appear to be as a result of cool water vapor rising up from the aquifer, the underground spring, beneath, and behaves in a manner similar to what happens in the lab when electrical discharges are created through water and different patterns emerge on the surface. The mist forms a little different from the triggering point, which would support what occurred in this case. You could see the circle growing. As for the height, it would be no higher than the radius of the formation created, and the mist cloud would grow as the formation grew. So I challenged him on that. I said, you know, science is absolutely devaluable and it's essential. But I said, at the same time, it doesn't explain everything. So she wrote back, and I said, there's more to this this phenomenon than, than just bare science. She wrote back saying the more complex patterns have additional information contained in the sphere, and who or what presses the button to make these is not within our present knowledge or understanding. And I think that fits the bill absolutely. There's, there's, an, there's so much in this subject which despite all our research, scientific research, medical research, we still don't understand. And many people, I went in oh, several days after, well, I visited it several days after it formed. And as I was walking down the tram line towards it with two friends, I suddenly had this gut feeling, don't go in. Mm. And so reluctantly, I listened, you know, one of the few times I did listen to my gut feelings, and I walked back. The two friends walked in, and they came out absolutely pea green with nausea. Why? Now, the thing is, it cleared. Once they were out of the radius, the energy radius of the circle, but friends, Canadian friends, who'd also been into it very early on, they came to stay the weekend with me. And one of them said he felt totally irradiated when he was in the circle. And he said, I do know what I'm talking about because I work with radiation. Oh, right. And the same thing is we went in. We, let, we, we didn't go back that weekend, but we went in the following Monday with fear and trepidation, I can tell you. And we all felt absolutely fine. And what seems to happen is that the more people who visit it, they soak up the energy rather like blotting paper. And I can tell you thousands of people came. People from all over the world came. And <laughs> the farmer, I think, made an absolute killing. He started off by charging a few pounds, and then I think it got to about 10 pounds a head. But anyhow, a lot of farmers, you know, they just don't keep the money for themselves. They help local causes and often 
have gone so far as to helping to re-roof the, their churches, their little local churches. So it can have a hugely beneficial effect on the, on the community. Uh, so that was outstanding. That was absolutely outstanding. Do some crop circles just never grow anything once the crop circle has been there? How, how do you mean? Well, if it's, say, in a farmer field or, or wherever, is there maintenance involved in keeping that circle there? Or do, you know, will new crops grow so that that circle disappears? No, no, it just stays as it is and because uh, it's flattened. Yeah. And very often the lay lay of the crop can be that and crop can be very, very intricate. It can have several layers overlapping each other, it can have weaving, it can have many, many different designs. There's a wonderful bounce. You know when you walk on a very wonderful carpet, there's a sort of bounce as you sink in. Yeah. As you walk in, if you're one of the lucky people to be one of the first into a circle, there's that wonderful bounce on the crop. But the more people who go in, of course, they flatten it much closer to the ground. They, they also, inevitably, they, they damage the crop. This is why, you know, the farmers really can't... Well, they, now that they've got technology that they could... I think it's a sort of laser technology. They can get very, very close to the ground when they're reaping, when they're harvesting their crops. So they're not losing as much as they, they did originally. But it's interesting, I once did some tests on seeds that I took from inside a formation where many, many, many strange things happened. I took seeds from inside and control samples from outside and sent them up to a lab to be tested blind. And the results came back which were absolutely astonishing. The protein content of the seeds from inside the circle was 40% higher than the seeds taken from outside. Wow, okay, and the action of flattening crops with a board, which I know that they did when they were faking it for these TV shows, wouldn't obviously have had that effect on the seed? Oh, it wouldn't. No, 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 absolutely, you're quite correct. Yes, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have any, any, any change on the protein level whatsoever. As I say, again, things are happening which we don't understand. You mentioned the effects on people and people coming out feeling irradiated, etc. I know that some of your research actually has shown changes in hormone levels of people who've come into contact with crop circles. A friend of mine who is still alive, she's, she's very bad with Parkinson's now, she was desperate to go into a crop circle. And knowing that there can be ill effects as well as healing effects, I said to her, I really don't advise you and I'm not going to help in, in taking you into a circle and because you, you're not well and I really don't think you should risk it. And so she was desperate. She said, please, 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 please. So I said, well, listen, what I'll do next year, I'll try and find a circle which is as nearly 100% beneficial as possible. So one up here called the Taurus Knot at Alton Prowse in Wiltshire in 1997. And I went down every single day from Hampshire and I went into the circle and I felt absolutely fine. And I stood at the end of the field and I collected reports from people. Incidentally, I have over 800 reports sent to me by people who have had strange effects both negative and positive, wow. when inside a circle or in the vicinity or even watching them on a screen because it's all to do with frequencies. Anyhow, there weren't any negative effects. And so I said to Mary, look, I think if you're absolutely determined, this could be the one for you, but please, please come out quickly if you don't feel well. So she went in with a friend of hers and they sat in the centre of the circle, and I don't know for how long, because just like uh, the taxi driver, you lose sense of time. You really have no idea. And the amount of time, the amount of times that I've lost all sense of time when I'm sitting in a circle. So she said she didn't really know, maybe about 20 minutes, possibly more. But the, the result was that she stopped shaking for 24 hours. Wow. Hmm. Now... You're quite right, wow, because when you have Parkinson's, 
you're shaking so many times per second. And for not to shake for a few minutes or a few hours, but 24 hours, I mean, that just doesn't happen. And she also had this amazing sense of well-being, which happens to many, many people after going into a circle. They have this extraordinary sense of well-being, which continues for many days afterwards. And so this came back to me. And I thought, well, now what is happening? I knew perfectly well things were happening to people in the field, but this was really astounding. So I found people, I found guinea pigs, and we started doing research into this. And technology, as the years went on, our our methodology and our technology improved. And really our turning point was in, I think it was just about 2000. 2005, when we went into one at Vernon Dean, actually it was probably later than that, we were finding that people were spiking, and and Parkinson's sufferers were spiking in the gamma level of brain activity. Now, I didn't know anything about gamma, except that it was a very, very high frequency between 32 hertz um, per second and 74 hertz per second. So I looked it up on the internet, I read copious articles, and in one of them I found it it read that in the gamma level of brain activity, the brain produces dopamine. Well, dopamine is the chemical that is missing in most, or depleted, in in most Parkinson's sufferers' brains, and they're given synthetic dopamine. So this was just like a sort of road to Damascus um, experience. And I thought, right, now we know what's happened to Mary in the field. She must have had a burst of dopamine. So I was talking about this uh, when I was giving a lecture in in Hampshire. And there were quite a few Parkinson sufferers said, oh, now listen, get in touch with this particular neurologist in the Midlands. So... (laughs) I don't have any letters after my name, and you know, it's, the crop circles have this awful publicity given to them, yeah. and therefore uh, rubbish. So it took me about two two weeks to summon up enough courage to ring through to this neurologist, and I felt very brave one morning. So before the bravery wore off, I grabbed the telephone, and I happened to get the neurologist absolutely himself on the line. So I plunged into what I was doing, and he stopped me in the middle. And he said, Lucy, this is very, very interesting, because you're following exactly the same line of research that I'm following. And he said, when we raise our patient's uh, level of brain activity to the gamma level, it inhibits their dyskinesia, i.e. it stops them shaking. And then he said, and I knew he was going to say this, I'm very sorry, I can't work with you. Well, he couldn't. He couldn't, but because he was, he was, uh, had grants from Wellcome and all sorts of other um, uh, trusts. And with the name that is given to Crop Circus, he would probably lost all his funding. But at least I knew I was on the right track, and I now have a medical team. I, don't, I'm not, I haven't got any science training behind me. It's just all gut feeling. And this is what we're doing. And we're getting extraordinary results. Well, I think if I suffered from Parkinson's, I would probably make going to that particular crop circle part of my morning regime every day. <laughs> Lucy, if you could put your finger on one thing that keeps you hooked on the phenomena, what would it be? I mean, it encompasses so many different things. You've got the mathematical You've got the unexplained element of it. You've got the artistic element of it. What element of this particular phenomena keeps you passionate about it? I can tell you that if it weren't for my research, I probably would have left the the subject a long time ago. But I'm fascinated in trying to learn more. And if, if in some way, Shelley, our research could benefit the medical world and ultimately find a cure for Parkinson's, then that would be testimony of the value of the crop circles. And to me, we are, well, we know something's happening. We can't prove exactly what it is. Every endeavor we make, 
we are continuing, and this is this is something that I'm going to continue as long as I possibly can. And also, one other thing I love is taking people on tours to see how they react, how the energy of the crop circle interacts with them. Sometimes they don't feel well, as they come out quickly. Other times, it seems as though, in a way, their whole lives are changed. And and I've had many, many reports from people who've been to lectures and, oh, I've had so many extraordinary, extraordinary, wonderful things happening by people just watching the photographs that I show on the screen. And it's all to do with the vibration, because it was Pythagoras who taught us the music and number were related. And so what you're getting is this music and frequencies, uh, music and frequencies come from music, of course. And so you're getting frequencies coming off these formations as you watch them. And there was a lovely report here, which I'm going to read to you, from somebody who was watching a presentation I did many years ago, where I did a sort of sight and sound presentation of a whole lot, just showing crop circle after crop circle after crop circle to wonderful background music. And she said, it wasn't until your presentation on the 27th of June that I realized my past, my present, and my future. In other words, my purpose came into being. The first three crop circles that you showed me in your sight and sound presentation hit me so powerfully that I wasn't able to breathe. I had an intense release of emotions, feelings of love, relief, knowing, meaning. Well, I think that's wonderful that she said, my purpose came into being. How many of us, I wonder, can actually say we know our purpose in life. And so some of these reports I get, you know, are really moving and wonderful. I think that we're just so grateful to researchers like yourself that are prepared to go out and spend the time doing this type of research and bringing this information to us. Because like you said, right at the top of the show, unfortunately, the mainstream media does frown upon some of these subjects. And I think that really it's a lack of understanding on their part, because I think that if really they knew a little bit more about it, and if maybe they took a little bit more time to take the subject seriously, they might actually realize that it's probably one of the best news stories. Like you said, there are people that go into these circles that feel this sense of well-being this sense of oneness with the universe and and with other people it almost i've heard people say who've experienced crop formations that they just had a, a feeling of almost minuteness that they were playing a very small part in a much bigger story you're quite right you're quite right shelley it's a very humbling it's a very humbling process to realize that you're just a very, very tiny part of something which is enormous. So I think that going forward, as I said, thank you very, very much for the research that you bring us. Keep on doing it. I think you said that you're <laughs> going to keep on doing it for as long as you can anyway. I know that people can get hold of some of the images of the photographs that you've taken, and I know that you've written some really well-respected books as well on the subject. So maybe you can give our listeners a little bit of an idea of where they can get hold of this. Yes, I'd be delighted. You can buy my book, this latest book, The Energy of Crop Circles, The Science and Power of a Mysterious Intelligence. You can buy that from my website, and I'd be very happy to sign it for you. Also, you can buy lots of other my other books, and I have many other things, wonderful jigsaw puzzles, wooden jigsaw puzzles, and, oh, bent pendulums, postcards, uh, all sorts of things, and every bit. Every single item that you buy goes towards my research. So I'm always profoundly grateful for any order I receive. And also my calendars for this year, uh, they're going extremely fast. They've got crop circles from what was happening in the field this year. So please, please have a look at my website and, and help my research. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well, yeah, thank definitely. you both very much too. Yeah, we really appreciate you spending some time with us this weekend. From Not all of our all. listeners and from ourselves, I realise that this is going out after Christmas, but we'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Oh, and, and, a very, and to both of you too. And a very prosperous and happy, healthy 2020. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.
<laughs> you look after yourself. Thanks again. All the best. All the best. Bye-bye Bye. now. Bye. Bye. Well, that was pretty interesting. It's going to make me want to go and research some more about Parkinson's and crop circles for sure. Yeah, well, you mentioned to Lucy off air, didn't you, that you deal with a lot of people every day who have Parkinson's and yeah. therefore have the thought that something like this could actually benefit them. It's actually quite yeah, have to pull together, resonates with you. Have to pull together an outing and be like, hey, everybody, get on the minibus. Let's go see a crop circle. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> And then all of a sudden they all come strutting back in going, woohoo! <laughs> Trouble is there'll be more tram lines through the crop circles where you're wheeling everyone through them. That's the problem. Well, yeah, but, you know, the end result. Could yeah. you imagine? Could you imagine whoever owned the field that that happened in? They'd be raking on some dough, don't you think? Well, if they came up with the answer to Parkinson's. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Come visit my crop circle. Not only can I give you corn, but I can give you, you know, a cure for Parkinson's. Yeah, well, no, we don't mean to make light of it. It was very nice of Lucy to come on, and, and, and we mean no disrespect whatsoever. It was very interesting, and I hope that her research does lead to something that is life-changing, world-changing. Yeah, well, certainly for those people with Parkinson's, definitely. No, I think that if anyone can do anything with this research, it's Lucy. She seems like a very resourceful and determined determined lady yeah i'm pretty sure that she'd get it sorted if if ever there's anything to come out of it i'm sure she will push it to the forefront thank you very much again for listening to our show we really do appreciate it don't forget you can pick up on all of the extra information and the show notes and everything else for our website which is www.weirdwackywonderful.co.uk you can also contact us via the contact page you can follow us on instagram twitter and facebook you can also look out for our merch as well. We're releasing some more merchandise soon. That's via our website as well. And make sure that you go to Lucy's website, as she told you about earlier, because even if you buy one book, then that will definitely help push your research that little bit further. Anyway, guys, don't forget, 2020 is well on its way. And during 2020, above all other things, you have to make sure that you stay weird, weird wacky, wacky, and, and wonderful. wonderful.